I hope you enjoyed this video. I wrote all of the music in this myself, so if you like it, you can listen to more of my music over on my music channel, which I'll link in the description. Enjoy the video. I always heard to never meet a childhood hero. I never really perceived it as a warning, though, but more of a precaution to not have one's hopes and dreams crushed. People often place those they don't know up onto pedestals, creating false idols of what a true artist or true craftsman should be. I, too, did such a thing, for I loved the exotic music of the great Nathaniel Kirksman. His music... The vast orchestra of ecstasy and intoxication chilled me to the bone since I first discovered the talents of the man. He often came to perform at the city's event center, where I always sat in attendance. I never found myself to be musically talented. I played the violin, often in my youth, but I gave that up. I lacked a rather particular skill. Not only that, I lacked vision, and vision is an artist's key. Not only did Kirksman possess such great vision, but every song dripped with the blood and sweat from his broken heart. I could feel it. It spoke to me, as often good music does, without any words. I could see exactly what he wanted me to. I felt myself lost to the visions created by such somber pieces. I came upon the luxury of meeting the man while I was still a student. I did not attend university to practice music. I went to become a journalist. If I could not create such amazing pieces, I could at least write about them. That was <laughs> such a foolish and sad thought in hindsight, but it's too late now. I received an assignment to go interview Kirksman before his final performance at the event center. The man grew old and tired, faster than he should have, too. He often proclaimed he was only fifty-five years of age, but he looked almost eighty. His final show would be something spectacular. It would be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I, of all people, was able to speak to the man before it all went underway. In the carriage ride to the man's flat, I found myself nervous. My hand shook as I pored over the notes that I had jotted down in my small notebook. The air of the city smelt different. It felt different. Cold and thick, with a soft blanket of fog that crept between the buildings. I feared myself dreaming. The moment was too good to be true, yet upon reflection I could have only hoped it to be such a thing. For an artist bleeds a red often unseen. Kirkman's flat was on the tenth floor of one of the most expensive complexes within the city. The stairs up did not bother me. They were decorated with such lavish paintings. Not only that, but the floorboards were polished white with small carvings engraved within them. I found myself lost to such beauty and could only imagine the money that it would take to live in such a place. Once I reached Kirksman's door, the rich mahogany wood stared back at me as I knocked. At first, no response came. Hell, not even a stirring within the apartment could be heard. I knocked twice more, and a voice, withered and old, came from within the flat. Are you the one the university sent? I am, I told the man. Why did they send a student? He asked. I couldn't think of a good answer, so I responded with, Why not? There came a slight chuckle that made me feel good. Very good. He spoke again. The door is open. I will be with you shortly. <coughs> I turned the brass handle and entered the man's flat. Upon entering, I felt something awry. While the entirety of the building sat with such luxurious fashion, the interior of Kirkman's apartment sat so unruly, so disordered, that I felt as if I stepped into a chaotic void. They were not a vibrant white, either. They towered, muddied, and yellowed from what little sunlight breached the soiled drapes. The furniture, tattered and torn, sat unorganized in the center of the parlor. A harsh smell of decay danced around my nose, for there had to be some critters loose within the clutter, dead or dying. I stood, a bit dumbfounded by the appearance of the man's apartment, but I regained my composure once he entered the room. When Kirkman stepped into the living room, he too did not appear as he did when he composed his works for large crowds. He did not wear a tuxedo, a suit, or any form of clothing that looked expensive. Instead, he stood shirtless in a pair of torn denim pants. He carried a worn towel on his shoulders. 
his graying thin hair raised and combed. His eyes were sunken too, battered around the edges from many sleepless nights. A slight wheezing slipped from his nostrils as his chest struggled to rise and fall with each breath. He moved past me, not looking into my eyes. He sat upon a torn chair, one that I believed decorated by mouse droppings. His voice cracked with ancient talent as he asked, So, what is it you wanted to interview about? I didn't respond. I just stared at the man, so confused by what I witnessed. Growing up, I imagined that he lived such a lavish lifestyle. I imagined him going on long walks in a fine suit with a luxurious cane. I imagined he drank a rich, dirty martini with every meal. I imagined him to be... so much more. He asked again, this time a bit impatient. What is it you wanted to ask? I stammered. Oh, Mr. Kirksman, I'm sorry. I'm just... a bit starstruck is all. He nodded. Go on. Ask away. I removed my notepad and began to flip through my notes. Though, before the man, I could not find the voice to ask anything that I had previously thought of. I spout out, uh, I'm in love with your piece, the Sonata for the Herald. I have adored the song since I first heard it. He nodded and spoke half-heartedly. I appreciate that. It is not a question, though, student. I'm sorry. I reiterated. There's just, um, there's so many things that I've always wanted to tell you and say... I've really enjoyed your music since I was a child. I think I've seen every show you've ever done. Your music speaks to me. You know, it, it makes me feel like I'm not alone. You're not alone, he said. That is the beauty of art. It connects us to people, to things, to such great wisdom. I nodded, writing that down within my notepad. I asked a question, finally, without looking to the man. Um, where do you get your inspiration? Deep within. His voice croaked. I'm not a man of talent, but one of application. You have great vision, I told him. Where does that come from? Not me, he said, looking away from where I stood, over to the off-white drapes of his parlor. I've seen things, dear student. I've seen and heard great wonders in my time, things that... I probably shouldn't have, that I'm afraid has made me feel so tired. I'm assuming that is where you find yourself feeling connected by the loneliness, albeit a different type of loneliness. I couldn't really process what the man spoke of. I chalked it up to him being older and aging rapidly. The quick thought of insanity pushed its way further into my skull but I waved it away with a quick flick of my wrist as I asked him. Um, who is the Herald? He turned his head back to me, raising his bushy right eyebrow. The what? Um, from the song, I clarified. The song, the sonata for the Herald? It's about a messenger, correct? Um, who is the messenger? He raised his long bony index finger, then pressed it against his bare chest. I felt stupid in that moment. Well, of course, he was the Herald. Of course. It all made sense, or so I thought, in that moment. He delivered such strange pieces to such lonely people like me. Of course, how stupid of me to ask. Kirkman knew that I felt ashamed by the question. He bobbed his head up and down, nodding to a thought that swarmed through his genius mind. He removed a cigarette from his pocket. The paper was torn around the edges, and tobacco dangled from the end. He lit it with a small matchbook that rested on the end table next to him. He blew a puff of smoke into the air and asked, Why do you like it so? I was caught off guard by the question. I knew deep down the answer, but not how to really process it. The song, so unique with its strings, so strange with its pianos, so deep with its drums, dug deep within me that I never even bothered to ask myself why I enjoyed it. It was just the craftsmanship, the hauntingly slow melody, the crashing crescendo. Everything about the song just connected to me in some sort of way. I, I told him so, and to that, he shook his head. He pointed to the small cabinet in the corner. You play, do you not? Uh, I did, I told him, 
the violin for a few years. You quit. I nodded. Smart boy, he said. Go there, though. Open that cabinet. I did as I was asked, having to bend over to open the old dusty cherry wood doors. Inside sat a violin, as dusty and uncased. The strings laid covered with such a thick film of filth that I thought them to snap by the pressure of my gaze. Kirkman spoke from over my shoulder. I use that to find all my tunes. I thought him a liar, for that instrument had not been touched in at least a decade. I removed the piece from the cabinet regardless, and held the bowstring in my right hand. He told me. Play it. Uh, excuse me? The sonata of the Herald. Play me your favorite part. A slight smirk lifted his face. I felt as if I needed to pick my jaw up from his rotting floorboards. I shook my head. Oh, I haven't tried in so long. I, I don't want to ruin your pieces. It was never my piece to begin with, he said. I'm nothing but a fraud, dear student. Try it anyhow. I will not be displeased. I lifted the bowstring and cradled the violin beneath my chin. I slowly rested the bow to the strings, watching as flakes of dust fell from the instrument. My eyes glanced to the man, who sat emotionless in his chair, just watching. I quickly moved the bow against the strings, trying to impersonate the rapid-fire sound of the violins during the climax of the piece, my favorite portion. Though the violin was out of tune, and only haunting screeches flooded the apartment. Kirkman stirred in his chair and quickly raised his hand. That's okay. The violin is too old. I stood, defeated, letting the violin slip from under my chin. I lowered the bow, and as I did, my head. I I'm terribly sorry, uh, Mr. Kirkman. I quite enjoyed it. The others, too. Others? I asked curiously. Kirkman shook his head quickly, lifting his ear as if he heard something far off trying to quickly capture whatever was said to him, though I heard nothing at all but the remnants of the vibrations of my awful performance. Kirkman spoke quickly. I have a gift, student. It's not one of talent or one that can be improved upon by application. It is a strange gift, one that I am only aware that I possess. I say that, not to sound arrogant, but tonight is my final show, and you are writing an article. You are writing a piece about me, a liar and a fraud. I am not a wizard of music, no, grand master of the arts. Look around. See these stacks of music? These are my pieces, the, my original pieces, ones that I tried to write by my own hand. They're awful, I tell you. They are no better than the display you put on before me. In fact, I think you have more talent than I. My lip quivered at the loaded compliment. Are you saying you're a plagiarist? Of the worst sort, he told me. I do not have a tongue to speak, nor ears to see. I do, however, have music to compose. Have you ever seen visions of things while listening? Sometimes, I admitted. It was true. I often found myself lost within my own thoughts, envisioning grand things while I listened to his music. He nodded. I do too, but they are not visions that I want you to see. They are visions that they want you to see. Understand? No, I said. Who are they? Kirkman stopped again, listening to the words I could not hear. He nodded quickly and then said, They are not here. They never are. They can't be here. They are nothing but apparitions as we are to them. They still feel, though. They still feel on the other side of the mirror, and though, long dead, they too have much to say and express. I turned slowly. I felt that he was ill-minded, worn over time by his art. I did not believe anything he said, even though I asked for clarification. Are you saying that you play the music of ghosts? He didn't move. He didn't speak. Kirkman just stared at me for a moment. His mouth hung open slightly, and a slight creak slipped from the back of his throat. He shook his head again, 
quickly this time, as if to snap out of whatever trance he was in. They are not ghosts, he said. Are you going to be in the audience tonight? I nodded, slowly, apprehensive. Well, it is my last show, and I see no problem in expressing this to you. I doubt I'll see you again, so this isn't that embarrassing after all. I disagreed, but did not speak on it. Kirkman continued. The final song in tonight's performance. Just listen. Please, listen. And with that, I had no more questions for the man and left his old, dusty apartment. I heard him shouting at himself once I shut the door behind me. As I walked down those long, lavish stairs, I thought of how crazed he became, how his art destroyed his soul. I was too lost within my own head over our meeting that the luxurious complex of where Kirkman lived appeared different to me. The rather fancy carvings were nothing but imprints. The gold trim around the wallpaper was nothing but tarnished brass. Everything felt different to me after that conference. And that is why I hated myself for ever meeting the man. I always loved the city amphitheater. As a child, even when sitting within the massive structure, I felt as if it was out of reach somehow. Red carpet covered the entirety of the floor, white pillars held the enormous domed ceiling overhead, etchings of the great musical masters sat engraved within the brass base of the pillars. The seats themselves were white, immaculate and clean to perfection. My box, one for the journalists, which would be rather expensive for a student like myself, had the college not paid for it, overlooked the grand stage. Its polished, deep brown mahogany glistened under the bright white stage lights. The orchestra took the stage, and the full house applauded them as they did so. They sat under those massive lights, and their instruments beamed a vibrant white hue. A lone pianist sat on the far right end of the stage, a staple of Kirkman's work. The orchestra sat at attention, listening to the crowd die down. When all was silent, the red curtain fluttered a bit on the left end of the stage, and out stepped Kirkman. His tuxedo reflected the light on the midnight black silk lining. He waved to the crowd as he made for center stage, and everyone, including myself, stood to applaud the genius as he took his position. Even though I regretted meeting the man, seeing him stand before the orchestra reminded me of why I loved him, why his music spoke to me, why I cared for anything at all. Kirkman raised his wand, and the orchestra raised their bows or their instruments ready to go. He gave a slight flick of his wrist as the light dimmed and the music began. After a few seconds of the violins humming a haunting tune, all lights but the spotlight went out. It stayed fixated on the crazed master as he waved his wand a little harder, a little faster, and the music began to pick up with him. The brass came in, roaring wildly and belting out harsh wails. The piano then came, playing soft, sweet notes that I felt danced within the air. I felt my vision blur as I became lost within the intoxication of the music. I could see a great field of golden grass under a gray sky. The clouds rolled over top, radiating a purple hue. A storm lingered in the distance, and I couldn't see it, but I knew so, for the music told me. It spoke to me in a way that I hadn't felt since the last Kirkman performance. Slowly, the song stopped, and another began. The piano opened this one. The rhythm of the keys started slow, but gradually grew brighter. Then, the violins came in with the rapid fire whines. I could see a great storm falling onto me as I stood in that field. The golden grass grew a deep smoky gray, while the clouds overhead turned to deep black with a slight green hue. 
The field began to wither away, wither into nothingness as the grass turned to ash and floated upwards towards the storm, upwards through the falling rain. As quickly as I felt that song begin, it ended. I felt cheated, for I only had but a sip of its ecstasy and needed more. Though, the next one began with deep bellows of the brass that startled me so. I looked around to the audience and they sat watching the show in such amazement. Just as I gazed upon them, the cellos began to hum behind the radical brass movements. It was then that I could see the storm part, but not stop. Behind it loomed a great structure one of grand construction. A tall tower sat atop a pyramid-shaped building, all of which glistened in the rain. They appeared to be made of ivory and bone, and atop the tower glowed a hellish flame within its stone housing. All music stopped, just as it all became so clear to me. The lights stayed low while the spotlight appeared to intensify. Kirkman lowered his wand as he turned his back. He stepped forward to the front of the stage, looking out into the deathly quiet audience. I knew he could not see them due to the blazing light upon him, but I also knew he didn't care. He saw other things, other things that haunted his poor soul. That is all that mattered to him. He spoke loudly, and his withered voice carried to the back of the grand hall. I wrote this song recently, and did not know what to call it. After an interview today, I have decided to name it A Song for a Student. The crowd began to applaud, but I did not. I knew the song would be for me, or about me. I feared what he had in store, though I feared what visions I would see. I also felt a great sense of pride that my favorite composer, one of great wit and mastery, named such a piece after me. Granted, it was not my name, but I knew the student as he knew the herald. I leaned forward in my chair as Kirkman turned his back to the audience, ready to begin the song. The basses began first, starting with the deep melancholy ball that sounded as if it was almost a choir, not an instrument. The audience in the stage began to fade from my vision as the apparitions of the Grand Tower began to take hold once more. The rain fell heavily, and the fire at the summit of the great structure roared wildly. The embers sparked from whatever burned within. Such oil would be needed for that mighty flame. The piano then began. A treacherous sound it was, not violent or harsh. The tune was soft and sweet and rich, but so fearfully dreadful. It echoed across the clouds, which began to swell and swirl around the tower. The strings came in next, with such a blood-curdling rhythm that I felt as if my heart stopped upon the sound. My vision darkened, but came right back to the tower, and the clouds, still spiraling around the barbican, bent and broke, revealing a strange flow of water that was part of the clouds, and in it, I could see bodies. They floated amongst the mist and liquid. Their skin was as gray as the grass from the fields. Their eyes were as bright and vibrant as the roaring flames of the tower, for they were the same color too. Their mouths were open, and as they screamed, the wails of the brass began to flow from their mouths. So terrifying a sight was, so hauntingly terrible. But I could not look away, for the music told me not to. It told me to stare into their faces, to see their pain, to hear their pain, and... I not only saw and heard, but I felt their pain. My heart beat wildly as the song grew louder and my soul felt as if it were lifting from my body, lifting towards that grand fire. Then the music stopped, though not altogether. My hallucination faded and I sat within the music hall again. Kirkman slowly waved his wand and the piano is all that played for a moment. That same haunting tune as before stretched across the room. It was in that moment that I realized it to be empty, and I was the only one who remained before the great Kirkman. His orchestra too faded, and it was just he and I, divided by the darkness and the pale. Chimes began to play. Their echoing, almost bell-like sound rolled across the empty theater. As they did, 
a, th a thick fog began to seep in from the massive closed doors at the back of the room. They opened, but nothing but darkness sat beyond. The mist rolled between the seats as if it were death coming to claim the firstborns. Once a sea of grey fog sat just before the stage, it began to rise, but it did not dare come toward my box, for I sat alone in the dark. The piano, with the chime still going, shifted its tune to something slowly, something more painful than terrifying. The familiar violins came back, it came in with a tune I had heard before, the same from the sonata for the Herald. I felt delighted by that, but... It soon faded as I watched dark figures rise from the fog beneath me. They appeared to be gray-skinned, withered folks lost within the clouds. Their arms were thrown outstretched towards Kirkman, who waved his wand to a non-existent orchestra. It was just the departed, him and I, within the grand room. Kirkman stood out of their reach but for a moment, for the fog rose and carried itself across the stage, blanketing it all. The figures carried themselves with it. Their long, bony fingers danced across Kirkman's tuxedo, which faded away from his pale, withering flesh. He stood naked with them in the shadows. The spotlight that Kirkman basked under turned a pale blue aura that looked as if it were a part of the man. The chimes continued, and the piano did too. The violins faded, but the bass came in stronger than before, low and rhythmic, but still powerful. The fog at the end of the stage began to part, and just beyond the darkness that laid at the edge of it, I could see that tower. I could see its roaring flame just off in the distance. A great expanse of water sat between us and it, black in color and beaming in their green glow. The waves crashed in sync with each key of the piano. Kirkman kept waving his hand. His eyes stayed closed. The gray folk from the fog continued to grab hold of him. They grew more violent, not just with Kirkman, but with each other. As each of the thousands tried to reach out and touch the man, they carried such pain, and he was their herald, as I was his student. Kirkman did not seem to mind, for he kept waving, unfazed by such a monstrous sight. The dead piled atop one another, and before I knew it, they swarmed around the composer, mirroring the great waves of that strange sea laid before us. They tugged and pulled at his bare arms. He fought them at first, still trying to play their music, their sorrow, their pain, their lives, their deaths, but soon the old man grew tired. I could see the fatigue set in. He stopped his composing, yet the music still carried on. Wounds appeared deep within the wrinkles of his chest, and a dark crimson flowed from them as the dead continued to claw away at his beating heart. He turned his back to the sea and out towards the fog-covered auditorium. At first he just stared off into the darkness. His eyes twitched within his sunken sockets, and the blue spotlights danced across his glossy irises. The violins faded, leaving only the piano and the chimes. Kirkman looked up to me and smirked as I stared back in such horror. The hands of the dead grasped his face, clawing at his flesh, and he did not budge. He just stared at me until he disappeared amongst the fog and the sea of the dead before me. The great ocean at the back of the theater rose and the amphitheater began to flood. The violin stopped, leaving only the chimes as it crashed over thousands of gray, withered figures in the hall. Water in the they great disappeared fortification the within its and mighty only flame off in the horizon. The chimes slowed, and they pulled away at me. They were filled with such pain, yet such peace, for they were not the chimes of the dead, but those of their herald, those of his student. They too then stopped, and a loud gasp filled the room. The spotlight turned off, and the theater lights turned on. The stage sat filled by the orchestra, and the auditorium was once again with its audience. Most stood curiously and concerned, for at center stage, Laid out before the conductor's stand was Kirkman. His tuxedo no longer glistened under the stage light. He lay it on his back, staring upwards. His legs appeared to be in an awkward position as if the man had collapsed during the performance. Screaming and crying began to fill the air. Musicians stepped away from their instruments to check on the man. I, however, did not feel concerned, for I saw what happened beneath the man's music. I saw what tormented the man's soul, made him feel as if he were crazed. I watched as all the light faded from his eyes, and I could see that anguish fade into peace. I knew then that he was not crazed, 
that he was not broken by some illness, but rather the voices that he carried with him. I felt terrible for doubting the man, doubting his craft. Everyone stood in the auditorium, everyone but me, who just stared at the motionless body of Kirkman. I found myself lost to the visions he presented, lost to the feelings he gave me. It was in that moment that I realized that Kirkman was much more than a musician, much more than a hero to me, much more than a genius. He was their voice, their herald, though there were many more songs to be written, had to be written. Kirkman just became another of the gray shadows beneath the fog, beneath the waves. The herald delivered his last message, and I bared witness to it all. And I felt the urge to play once more.